they have a system when practicing vipassana. You can't get there by doing the jhana. It has to be vipassana the way it talks about in the Visuddhimagga. Or the commentary to the Visuddhimagga, which is what Mahasi Sayadaw wrote. And he says, you get to a place that's called equanimity to formations, Sankaru Pekka. And as you go deeper, there are lights that come in your mind, and different lights mean different things. And then you'll get to a place where your mindfulness is so sharp that you will see impermanence very, very quickly, five or six times. Or you will see suffering very quickly, five or six times. Or you will see what they call not-self, five or six times, very quickly. And then there's a blackout that's very similar to the cessation of perception and feeling. When your mind comes back, what happens, it's automatic and it's the darndest thing I've ever experienced because it's described exactly. You see all of the insight knowledges one by one and how they occur. What they're doing is they're taking those insight knowledges and they're replacing dependent origination with these insight knowledges. And you have experienced Nibbana according to that system. So it's a little bit different. And to my way of thinking and experiencing, it is not Nibbana that they are experiencing. Why? Because when you get to Sankaru Upeka, the equanimity to formations, you are in access concentration. Access concentration pushes down the hindrances, doesn't allow them to come up. They call this purifying your mind when the hindrances aren't there. And in a way, they are right. But people that practice Vipassana, they always take the hindrances as a real inconvenience and an enemy to ignore, push down, fight with, push away, and try to force away. So when this happens, they are not having the opportunity. They are not having the opportunity to see things as they really are. They don't have the opportunity to see that dependent origination does not occur over three lifetimes. As it says in the Vasudhi Maga, but it occurs very, very quickly, over and over again. Now, by the force of the concentration being that strong, and they, if you if you say, well, you're suppressing the hindrances, they'll say, no, I'm not suppressing the hindrances. But, in fact, the force of the concentration is suppressing the hindrances. Now, when you get into this state, you can test it to see whether the hindrances really are pushed down or not. You can try to bring up an angry thought. And when you do, your mind will look at that and says, no, and just drops it. It won't entertain it. You can do that with any of the hindrances. Mind will not accept it at that time. 
Uh, where is your uh, attachments? Your attachments are in the hindrances. Have you purified yourself by seeing these attachments and letting them go? No, you have suppressed them by the force of the concentration. So they're there for just a sh the they're suppressed until you get up and start walking around and your concentration wavers and then you have the hindrances again. Um, I was wondering um, that at a certain point you go you have sufficient of perception of food, right? Yes. So I was wondering if in their system, you get so much concentration, you could never reach that because if you don't have any concentration at all, all your friends would be like, wow, we're here. That's why I said it's similar to. That's what makes things so confusing because so many of the things that they're putting in are similar. But they're not exactly the same. Yeah, so you, and, and they've had a thousand years of the Vasudhi Maga and working with that to make it sound like it really does work. Well, when people are practicing uh, the Vipassana, the way it's being taught, they're taught to move very, very, very slowly. How can you, yeah, how else can you keep your concentration going? So what, what does that have to do with living? Okay. With the fading away as well of rapture, of joy, he abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. Now, isn't that an interesting statement when you get to the third jhana? Still feeling pleasure with the body, but people that are practicing one-pointed absorption, concentration, don't have any feeling in their body at all. It's strictly a mental process. Because the force of the concentration is pushing everything else away. I had 20 years of research into this. And you don't need to put yourself through these kinds of problems. But don't worry about pain that somebody else has. If they're getting pain or vertigo, when people are practicing meditation, you want to get them to start adding that extra step of relaxing, and that will go away. Pain still arises in the body. That's only natural. Having a body means that you're going to have pain. But what you do with the pain is completely different. Now, I, I had a monk friend. He had a toothache. It was an abscess tooth. He had to go to the dentist. And he'd say, oh, I just can't stand this pain anymore. And he would go into his room and he would meditate. And while he was in his absorption state, he didn't feel any pain. And then he came back out, and about ten minutes later, he said, Oh, the pain is so bad. Now, what did he do with that pain? He just pushed it away with the force of the concentration. But, when you practice the way that I'm suggesting that you practice, you see how pain arises and how your mind doesn't like it and grabs onto it and causes all kinds of thoughts to arise 
and it makes the pain bigger and more intense until it turns it into an emergency and you have to go to the dentist right away to get it fixed instead of relaxing into it and allowing it to be. Pain is a great teacher because there's so much attachment and wanting it to be different than it is. <laughs> 